listening to this, you are the resistance. Prometheus, symbolism, myth, and religion. While a lot of creation myths share similar origins, borrow, copy, or steal from each other, this movie, Prometheus, touches on a vast number of them, sometimes in a subtle manner, sometimes very obviously, sometimes inexplicably. With the amount of research and money that goes into the making of these big budget blockbusters, it should go unsaid that the placement of seemingly insignificant props, words, scenes have not only an obvious significance, but often have an underlying hidden meaning. I hope that this video will help decipher some of those ideas and show that this work of fiction is actually based on real human constructions from ancient to modern. Referenced in this movie are the following. Prometheus is a 2012 motion picture directed by Ridley Scott and set as a prequel to the Alien movie franchise. Some of the main characters are Elizabeth Shaw, a scientist, a believer, the protagonist, Holloway, a scientist and Shaw's partner, David, a robot created by Whalen Enterprises, Mr. Whalen, a trillionaire CEO of Whalen Enterprises, Ms. Vickers, Whalen's supervisor for the mission and daughter, Captain Janik, who is captain of the ship Prometheus, Fifield, who is a scientist and geologist, and the engineers, uh, the name given to the aliens of the movie. I'm not going to go over the plot directly in this video, but I have included a synopsis from Wikipedia in this and the next frame. Uh, I suggest pausing this if you wish to read or refresh your memory, uh, but it is not necessary for the purpose of this lecture. And again, I would pause here if you wish to read this. We're going to move on. With Prometheus, the Greek creation myth. Uh, Prometheus was a titan in Greek myth and was given the task of creating man. Prometheus shaped man out of mud and Athena breathed life into his clay figure. He also most famously stole fire and returned it to mankind. In retribution, Zeus, the king of the gods, gave mankind woman. Pandora was her name and her jar of ills uh, as a gift and he set Prometheus to eternal punishment by having his liver eaten by an eagle daily. In Hesiod's scriptures, Prometheus represents the descent of mankind from the communion with the gods into the present troublesome life. Carl Martin Dietz. Prometheus is the title of the movie and also the name of the spacecraft that travels to the interstellar destination. In a scene from the movie, the holograph of the old man, Mr. Whalen, says, The Titan Prometheus wanted to give mankind equal footing with the gods, and for that he was cast out of Olympus. The time for his return has come. Which interestingly uh, draws focus to the fire-giving Prometheus uh, myth, not the uh, man-creator Prometheus myth, uh, which seems to predominate our, uh, our understanding and schooling. The opening scenes of the movie reveal the most ancient of creations, uh, starting with the sky, land, and water, as in the legends of the Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian, Genesis in the Bible, etc. Once that has been created, it needs to be populated with animals, and man. The Garden of Eden. In Genesis, in the second part of Genesis, God creates man from dust and breathes life into him, Adam. He creates the Garden of Eden and places man in it, with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He then creates the first woman out of one of Adam's ribs. 
tricked by the serpent and having eaten the forbidden fruit, they are cast from the garden so as to not eat of the tree of life and gain immortality. Uh, the forbidden fruit. Uh, the pomegranate was cultivated since ancient times, uh, including uh, ancient Mesopotamia, Babylon, Sumer. Um, and is also known as the seeded apple and is often thought to be the biblical forbidden fruit. In the movie, the alien engineer puts this on the, the ground next to the waterfall, uh, the inside of the seeded apple pomegranate, the inside of the alien version, similar. The alien engineer eats it. And also there was the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And uh, the first xenomorph alien in the movie Prometheus is this uh, cobra-like serpentine creature. And strangely enough, uh, like the Garden of Eden, the characters are not afraid of the snake or serpent, whatever, until, of course, something happens. Next idea is the idea of panspermia. Now, panspermia is a Greek word that translates literally as seeds everywhere. Uh, the panspermia hypothesis states that the seeds of life exist all over the universe and can be propagated through space from one location to another. The idea of directed panspermia is the intentional spreading of the seeds of life to other planets by an advanced extraterrestrial civilization or the intentional spreading of the seeds of life from Earth to other planets by humans. This uh, was coined by Francis Crick of the DNA double helix discovering Watson and Crick fame. So after the uh, eating of the fruit, you see the uh, alien engineer starts to disintegrate, falls into the water, his DNA breaks apart and then begins to reassemble new organisms, cells start to multiply, are seeded. Now we move on to the idea of the Nephilim, or, or giants, the uh, origin of genetic evil. A titan, by definition, was one of a family of giants in Greek mythology. Uh, Atlas was a titan giant, and he's known as holding up the uh, earth on his shoulders. So Prometheus was a tight titan giant. The alien engineers are giants. Uh, the biblical Nephilim are giants. Uh, in the King James Bible, the Nephilim are replaced by giants. Uh, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And in Numbers 13.13, 13, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. The Anakim were a formidable race of giant warlike people who occupied the lands of southern Palestine near Hebron before the arrival of the Israelites. The Anakim's ancestry has been traced back to Anak, the son of Arba, who at that time was regarded as the greatest man among the Anakim. The Hebrews thought them to be descendants of the Nephilim, a powerful race who dominated the pre-flood world. So we have Anak, father to the Anakim, descended from the Nephilim. This will be interesting when we come to the Sumerian creation story. The Book of Enoch, Nephilim, uh, chapter 7. It happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days that daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, the watchers, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became enamored of them, saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives from the progeny of men, and let us beget children. 
Then they took wives, each choosing for himself, whom they began to approach and with whom they cohabited, teaching them sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of roots and trees. And the woman, conceiving, brought forth giants. David and Goliath. We have the robot David 8. Um, and many Bible scholars speculate that the Anakim's descendants were the Philistine giants that David encountered, including Goliath of Goth. In this movie poster, I find it interesting that it says on the bottom, don't run, pray. In the movie, the idea of ancient civilizations is the preface for the journey to this uh, planet that they're going to. Uh, based on the discovery, uh, most recent discovery in the movie, of this uh, 35,000 year old cave painting in which this person is pointing to a um, series of globes or circles, spheres in a certain pattern on the wall that they've seen repeated um, enough to know that uh, they're thinking that this is a map, an invitation and a map. This actually is from the movie, but it's uh, borrowed from real cave paintings. And you'll see the, uh, the horses on the side, um, some of these older men are actually Australian cave paintings, uh, similar to, um, we have this cave painting, um, that appears to depict two beings in protective suits holding strange in implements. And that seems similar to what we see in the movie here as well. Uh, these kind of headgear and whatnot. Um, so in the first ancient civilization, um, that they talked about and uh, it's real life. We have uh, virtually every story that's in Genesis, the flood story, the Adam and Eve story, they all have precedence with the ancient Sumerians. Uh, the Sumerian story as told by translator Zechariah Sitchin is that the Anunnaki came to earth and created a primitive worker called an Adam U through genetic engineering. The Anunnaki created humans as a slave species. According to the Oxford Companion to World Mythology, the Anunnaki are the Sumerian deities of the old primordial line. They take their name from the old sky god, An, Anu. You saw earlier with the uh, Bible verses, we have a similarity with the Anak, Anahim, and now the Anunnaki. This Sumerian scroll, uh, on the far left, you'll see a star cluster, which is oftentimes considered to be um, the Pleiades star cluster, but very uh, akin to the um, idea of the movie in the cave painting as being these um, star, star map kind of ideas. You also have a few different ideas in this. You have the people flying in this solar disk. You have this uh, Dagon and Tree of Life or machines. In this other Sumerian tablet, uh, there's this heliocentric um, galaxy, if you will, towards the left between those two characters uh, and actually has a, a the proper number of planets, which would have been unknown at that time for sure. Some other uh, ancient crafts from work from this time. You have the Wayland uh, Enterprises Corporation logo, which very much looks like these uh, winged uh, Sumerian entities, um, but not even so much as the emblem that's above the name tags on the uniforms. So they actually have the wings themselves with the Wayland W in the middle. And this is a uh, you know, an ancient symbol. Wanted to just point out some of this cuneiform writing on this uh, tablet. So I find the, uh, the tattoos on the side of this character, Fifield, to be very interesting. Uh, this character carries a lot of symbols and patches around that we'll get to. Um, so I don't uh, 
don't find it unusual that the tattoos would actually be some sort of reference to uh, ancient languages, whether it would be Iberian, Celtic, or Sumerian, but definitely um, some sort of language. Here you have a depiction of the Sumerian creation of man. And there's a couple of things to notice. You have the tree of life over there on the, the right side. Um, but specifically here, the jars uh, are of interest to the, uh, to the left, in which case it seems like they're giving this um, something from the jar to drink or some sort of vessel a cup from the person in the middle, which is interesting. So as notice in the movie, there's are these containers. Um, they first uh, discover this room that may be a tomb or is this sort of like uh, uh, interesting place that has all of these vessels that contain this uh, that contain this black organic goo. And what's interesting about that as well is something happens in this room where in the cut that they first in the trailer as he's exploring behind this huge head that is in this room as well there's a cup on the altar if you will in front of this sculpture and then in the theatrical cut they remove the cup and they put this green crystal in there it's a kind of a you know a debate as to what this signifies and my uh, speculation is that it could reference the emerald tablets um, and by association the alchemical vitriol. Now the alchemists, uh, the medieval alchemists, believed that the emerald tablet, uh, a picture of which is there, described the action of seven chemical compounds known to the ancients as the arcana or great secrets. The arcana were the divine secrets of creation the basic archetypes after which all things were patterned, which kind of lends credence to uh, at least the, we're, in, we're within the parameters of the storyline with this. But also uh, important to note that the most important compound, uh, the one in which all the other reactions took place was vitriol. And it was distilled from an oily green substance that formed naturally from the weathering of sulfur bearing gravel. And after this green vitriol was collected, it was heated and broken down into iron compounds and sulfuric acid. The acid readily dissolves human tissue and is severely corrosive to most metals, although it has no effect on gold. So uh, we had the green oily substance with the fingers. Now we have um, definitely acid plays into the, the mythos of the uh, xenomorph alien creatures. Another interesting thing about vitriol, um, it also shows a tremendous thirst for water. If a flask of vitriol is allowed to stand open, it absorbs water vapor from the air and overflows its container. The sulfuric acid in vitriol is the agent of transformation in most alchemical experiments. In the movie, the, and you'll see in the bottom here, you have the, the containers uh, to the left are Whole. So the metal containers go from this pristine quality from when they enter the room to perspiring, kind of sweating as uh, water vapor is entering, entering into the air, and then they start to overflow the uh, containers. The black goo starts to overflow, similar to how uh, vitriol would, would act. Having removed their helmets, the characters realize that they have changed the atmosphere. Um, so they see it first on the murals on the wall, they start to deteriorate. And the containers behave similarly to, the, to what vitriol would as they start to overflow the containers and actually even create um, little ponds of this black goo by, uh, by the time the movie is over. David takes a drop of this uh, on his finger and says, big things have small beginnings. Uh, you'll also notice he has the uh, Wayland logo embedded in his fingerprint. In ancient Babylon, the Babylonian creation myths, 
um, the Sumerian god Enki becomes Ea in the Akkadians and the Babylonians. Uh, Ea and his wife Denkima, they give birth to the main Babylonian god, who's Marduk. Marduk kills the creator god, Apsu, which is uh, like the heavens. Um, and to avenge this uh, killing of Apsu, the goddess Tiamat gives birth to many monsters, including giant snakes with venom in their veins instead of blood, terrible dragons. Again, this seems to fit in with the uh, xenomorph mythos. Now Marduk decides to perform miracles. Um, he outlines his plan to Ea. Blood will mass and cause bones to be. I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. Verily, savage man I will create. He will be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. Again, reminiscent of the uh, Sumerian uh, Anunnaki creating kind of a slave race. Um, but Ea suggests a slight alteration to the plan. They should destroy one of the rebel gods and create humans from him. So when Marduk asked the gods who incited uh, Tiamat to create all of those terrible dragons and start this war, they answered uh, Kingu. So Ea takes Kingu, cuts his arteries, and makes mankind from his blood. Uh, Ea then imposes the toil of the gods upon mankind, while Marduk divides the gods up and assigns them their various positions in heaven or earth. And in the movie we have uh, when the engineer eats of the fruit and then you know, before he starts to disintegrate, you'll see his veins uh, kind of become um, blackened. And then they have this quick scene of this black bloodish liquid rushing down his arm. Um, in the ancient Egyptian creation myths, uh, they also used the winged solar disc, which we showed back as kind of part of the uh, Wayland logo and patches. Now, uh, for the Egyptians, uh, out of the chaotic water rose Atum, the sun god of Heliopolis, whom had created himself through thought and will. He first created a hill and would later be identified with the sun god Ra, and the hills would become pyramids. In the movie, uh, when they first arrive to their destination, this is where they, they come upon, and uh, this is the hill that they're going to go to to try to find the beginnings. When they uh, start scanning the interior of the hill, uh, Captain Janik at one point refers to it as the pyramid scan. Another quick frame in the movie kind of shows this um, skeletal mountain as a storm comes in, which reminds me of the Egyptian Sphinx and also has um, ties to genetic uh, engineering, possibly. Uh, you have the escape pod design, which clearly has an Egyptian... Uh, reference to it. I mean, it looks very uh, much like a sarcophagus. You even get inside of it. Uh, uh, the character uh, Fifiel, the one with the tattoos on his head, uh, asks, was this some kind of god, something they worshipped? They're talking about this uh, huge uh, human-like statue in this room. And that's reminiscent of uh, some of these ancient Mesoamerican uh, statues from the Olmecs. Uh, they have these colossal heads, uh, as well as uh, Easter Island, etc. They also say God doesn't build in straight lines as they're approaching this uh, hill. And so you see there are kind of lines on the ground there. To me, this could easily reference the uh, Incan Nazca lines, you know, saying that... Uh, these can only be viewed from, you know, up in the up in the air, and were made way before flight was a, a possibility for uh, anyone. You also have um, this Maya Mayan engraving, which is very interesting. It shows a uh, a Mayan in there, which appears to be some sort of mechanical apparatus 
and peering through something uh, with pedals and switches and looks very similar to what the uh, engineer kind of does and gets into when he's uh, trying to take this uh, ship out of here. Here's a representation uh, of what's happening in the movie Prometheus with the uh, alien, very similar to the Mayan engraving. Uh, put Zoroastrianism in here quickly because of just a couple of things that popped up that reminded me. Uh, first, there's definitely an ontology between uh, the symbol here on the bottom, how, how it developed through the uh, Sumerian, the Assyrian, the Egyptian. Um, well, Zoroastrianism is one of the world's oldest monotheistic religions, uh, founded by the prophet Zoroaster in ancient Persia uh, approximately 35,000 years ago. And his uh, symbol evolved from the Assyrian Asher. Um, and you see here is the symbol of Zoroaster where uh, he's left the uh, inner solar disk, stands in it almost like the ancient Sumerian uh, people riding in that uh, disc thing. Um, he's set the bone down and now has uh, taken a ring um, as a symbol. And this picture I found interesting in relation. Um, here is a portrait of Zoroaster holding a, uh, a blue sphere with these uh, yellow dots around it. And also you see the sphere of what appears to be like an Earth-like planet. And that reminded me in the movie of this area, the kind of the map room of the engineers, where they have this globe with all of these dots around it. And they even have this, uh, you can see that in there is uh, one of Earth. And they well, even pan on the uh, stop on Africa. And we all know there is an African uh, origination theory, you know, uh, mostly to do with uh, evolution. And one of the characters in the movie uh, earlier would said uh, to Shaw about believing that we came from somewhere else, basically says, scoffs at her and says, if you're willing to discount 3,000 years of Darwinism, that's woo. Um, so all of these creation stories um, are contrary to the theory of evolution that we, um, and that is, uh, the theory of evolution is still a theory. Next, we'll move on to the uh, cult of Saturn. Um, this is not a picture of Saturn right here. This is a picture of the planet in the movie, um, which has a sun a lot like ours, uh, has one planet which remains unnamed, but is clearly a ringed planet, and has a moon suitable for life. Uh, so this is uh, just very similar to Saturn. And what would be the uh, significance of that? Well. A lots. Um, there's a lot of ancient Saturn uh, mythos as far back as the Sumerians and the Babylonians. We have uh, Osiris, Kronos, Brahmo. You have the cult of Capitoline Hill, uh, human sacrifice. And you have uh, theories of changing positions in the solar system. Was, was uh, Saturn once closer to us? than it is currently is. Was Saturn once a brown dwarf star? Is Saturn uh, considered to be the second sun, the black sun? These are all uh, ideas and theories that uh, do exist. And Saturn is symbolized by uh, lots of different uh, objects and ideas. Um, they arrived to this planet on Christmas day. Uh, which was previously known as Saturnalia, uh, the great Roman holiday. Uh, you also have the tree here, uh, which represents the tree of life from the ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, etc. Um, and you have the character Vicar state, she sees this, what the hell is that? So even today there's focus on Saturn. We have the Cassini. Uh, satellite running over there taking pictures. Uh, its moons are all interesting. There's possible signs of life on several of them. Um, and there is the, is the center of uh, speculations about alien colonization. 
uh, the destination moon is called LV223. And I couldn't help but point this out. And anyone who knows much about uh, a cult will see this and understand that uh, we have 322 in reverse. And that is the secret number for the Skull and Bones Society at Yale. Here we have the character Fifield again, wearing some interesting patches, and we'll show how those relate to Saturn. First of all, you have the Saturn moon, Mimas. I don't know if I'm pro pronouncing that correctly, but you might also recognize that as like the Death Star from Star Wars. But see his patch down there clearly mimics what would be the moon of Saturn. You also have this other patch, which is a uh, black sun, the black sun rays. And that's also a symbol of Saturn. We have this black sun here, which is the kind of the map room, height cryogenic. Um, Titan again. Titan is a moon of Saturn. And it's also known as Saturn VI. So we have the Titans weaving their way through this movie. This trailer, what is this planet that is uh, kind of shadowing? The Roman god Saturn uh, evolved from the king of the Greek titans, Kronos. Kronos was uh, actually overthrown by Zeus and Prometheus. He becomes today's Grim Reaper. You notice the sickle and the hourglass. He's the creator of time. He has evolved from uh, Kronos to Saturn and all from the oldest god, Baal, here. It's also associated with the devouring of children and the Baphomet image. The ancient Greek god Pan is uh, also associated with Saturn. Um, and this kind of becomes the basis for many representations of Satan, which comes from Saturn or the devil. And you'll notice uh, the cloven feet, the horns and the flute because the flute symbolizes Pan. And in Prometheus, the flute is a prop used to kind of start the alien spacecraft. So you have, uh, through this holograph, the aliens pick up the flute, play the flute a few notes, and the machines turn on. Later, David would uh, mimic this to uh, presumably uh, get the ship going. The Star of David is a symbol of Saturn. And the Star of David, of course, is the hexagonal. Uh, and that could be because of a hexagonal storm on the North Pole of Saturn. These are images from the Cassini. You have the Star of David with Pan in there. Also, uh, remember the Sumerian scroll, the outlines around the uh, center sun uh, thing is six-pointed hexagon. The cube is a symbol of Saturn uh, for some reason. They uh, use this cube to kind of project uh, an image when they're, I guess they're first talking about the ancient civilizations and Holloway pulls out this cube and pushes a couple buttons on it. And remember, the punishment for Prometheus returning of the fire was uh, the creation of Pandora and her jar of ills, which has evolved into uh, Pandora's box. I have another cube uh, in the movie, this uh, virtual um, Saturn, Satan. Um, in the Bible, Jesus tells his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And that's in Luke 10, 18. Um, so lightning can symbolize um, Satan in this movie as they're approaching the um, alien ship. And you can see here on the bottom these uh, Nazca, quote unquote, Nazca lines. They say God doesn't work and build in straight lines. And you have lightning start uh, crashing. 
Uh, you also have the idea that uh, Prometheus as the light bearer. Um, so uh, an author of the 1952 literary psychological book, Lucifer and Prometheus, R.J. Orblowski, sees the myth of figures such as Satan and Prometheus as expressing the shortcomings of the world as conceived by the human soul. Just drawing this connection between uh, Lucifer, not so much Satan, but Lucifer and the light bearer uh, and Prometheus himself. Also, um, Lucifer is known as uh, dawn, you know, symbolized by dawn, the morning star of dawn. And we see that um, in this scene from the movie. We also touch upon Rosicrucianism in this uh, movie. Not, not in great depth, but we have to understand that a uh, couple things about Rosicrucianism. First, it's built on esoteric truths of the ancient past. Uh, we're kind of dealing with esoteric truths of the ancient past. You'll notice in this even a uh, depiction of the winged, uh, you know, almost you have the winged solar disk kind of happening in this title. And for some reason, uh, one of the props they brought is a rose. Uh, a rose was frozen um, so that uh, Holloway could give it to the believer Shah who wears the cross. So you have the rose cross. It kind of foreshadows maybe his own death with this uh, scene and image with the rose. And it lends itself to the alchemical uh, in the scene with the rose and they have incense burning an upside down plant with old looking books underneath it. And again, remind you that uh, the Rosicrucianism is built on esoteric truths of the ancient past um, in, in a very alchemical sense. So just to throw that out there. Um, so the Rosicrucian interpretation of the uh, book of Genesis is the, in the beginning, God conceived the creation of the universe and the thought directed the vibrations of the spirit into all space, which was void. God then ordained that the spirit should have symbols through which it might manifest itself to all created things and send forth its vibrations and they would be for signs and for seasons by which time and life might be measured. And the spirit created man in God's cosmic image from the animal cells in the earth, both positive and negative, male and female, were the creations of cosmic expression. I'm not going to really get too much into that. Paradise, the name of the uh, follow-up movie to Prometheus, coming in, uh, looks like, April 3rd, 2016, about a year. Uh, you have the Christian narrative of uh, the movie. We have this character, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, who, from the very beginning, uh, is made clear, is a uh, Christian. She wears this cross, which was um, given to her from her father, right? So she's the only movie character to have an apparent religious belief, and we're shown that very clearly. She's also the only one to survive the movie, along with the robot David. Um, in a dream flashback, Shaw's father tells her that everyone has their own word for the place after death, um, heaven, paradise. Uh, when pushed further, Shaw's father responds, it's what I choose to believe. And Shaw repeats this phrase when questioned by crew members about her beliefs of the map um, at the beginning of the movie, as opposed to believing in Darwinism. She says, it's what I choose to believe. So here's one of those dream sequences where the cross from her father is kind of put into her palm. And we see it again, kind of dangling there. Um, it's used as a prop throughout the movie. Um, and throughout the script words and phrases like, what the hell, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Oh God, oh my God, as well as God forsaken rock in the middle of space. That's a ship, a goddamn ship. I'll be damned. Uh, these all give a sense that the characters uh, and their religious leanings seem to be Christian in nature, uh, which is placed 80 years in the future. Uh, when the body of one of the dead engineers is dated, it's said to be around 2,000 years ago, give or take. So Prometheus set around 2094, so that puts their attempt at return, the alien return, somewhere around the beginning of AD, or around uh, the time of Christ, somewhere around there. 
However, uh, it is only Shaw that is a true believer out of the group. And she's challenged, maybe even tempted into losing her faith. This scene as they exit the uh, cryo, uh, cryo chambers at the beginning reminded me uh, of the crucifix. Immediately, uh, they eat and drink. This machine in the middle kind of uh, dispenses liquids and the drink is, uh, that's coming out that they show is this red and pours thicker than water, but it isn't like a uh, puree or anything. So is it blood? I don't know. Uh, Shaw says, I'll try to keep my feet on the ground. Later in the movie, Mr. Whalen's feet are being washed by David. And this is definitely reminiscent of Jesus prior to the Last Supper in the Bible, washing the uh, feet of his disciples. Um, those that sacrifice themselves in the movie put out their arms. Um, Holloway had a cross tattoo that was visible for uh, a few frames. And he uh, sacrifices himself with his uh, arms out. Captain Jenick um, and the co-pilots Chance and Ravel all sacrifice themselves, arms out. Vicky even says it, uh, arms out. Uh, the character Shaw um, is tested a few times. The first time after the initial discovery of the engineers, um, Holloway says, guess you can take your father's cross off now. Shaw responds, why would I want to do that? Holloway says, because they made us. And Shaw says, and who made them? But uh, David uh, goes to take off. After Shaw has had uh, relations with Holloway, who was contaminated with the alien vitriol goo, uh, Shaw has to go to the, the med room and... David tries to take the cross off, says, I'm going to have to take this. It may be contaminated. And so he takes this and uh, puts it into this medical plastic kind of uh, vial and says, it must feel like your God abandoned you. Uh, we also have, for seemingly no plot reason, we have learned that Dr. Shaw cannot have children, that she's sterile. Yet, she becomes impregnated with Holloway's mutated vitriol, if you will. Um, is this a hint at some sort of immaculate conception? Uh, towards the end of the movie, um, Shaw wishes to reclaim her lost cross. So she says to David, where's my cross? And he responds, even after all this, you still believe, don't you? And in the, uh, the room that had the f containers with the black goo, uh, the big Olmec looking head on the back was this uh, sculpture. And to me, kind of uh, looks reminiscent of an alien crucifixion. I don't know. Even in this movie poster. And Lovecraft and the Cult of Cthulhu. This might be way out there for some, but I couldn't help make this connection based on a few things, uh, most notably the creature effects at the end of the movie. Uh, now one must understand that Lovecraft actually created a mythos, and actually it's followed. Uh, there is a legitimate cult of Cthulhu today. Uh, he's not only regarded as the father of modern horror, but undoubtedly had read and studied many of the, many of the ancient texts that we've gone over here himself, uh, having educated himself in the extensive family library. Um, an ongoing theme in Lovecraft's work is the complete irrele irrelevance of mankind in the face of the cosmic horrors that apparently exist in the universe. Lovecraft made frequent references to the Great Old Ones, a loose pantheon of ancient, powerful deities from space who once ruled the Earth and who have since fallen into a death-like sleep. I, that would fit with the uh, xenomorph alien mythos as well. Some ancient depictions of Babylonian and 
a Sumerian of these Dagon, Ea, fish, the fish, Dagon, Babylonia, and of course, uh, Lovecraft wrote uh, his short stories, Dagon, Cult of Cthulhu, among others, that have undescribable horrors, often with these tentacles, dark, ancient, foreboding, um, evil creatures. And then in the uh, Prometheus movie, Shaw's conception is this squid-like creature that would uh, take one of these engineers in its uh, grasping tentacles and get on top of it, face hugging it for the first time in the creation of the first of what we have come to understand as alien. And at the end of the movie, Shaw states, uh, as the only survivor along with the robot David, I want to go where they come from. So what will she find in Prometheus 2, titled Paradise? The priests with their saucers or the warriors with their crafts? Thanks for watching.